Hey, uh, and welcome back. Yeah, I love my voice too. So yeah, um, subscribe right, right quick. White, right, white. Right. Subscribe right quick because yeah, like ninety-five percent of you guys are not subscribed to watch the video. That's kind of weird and corny and lame. But I digress. You feel me? Get my channel up so I can get the real editor to you know put this together nice. You feel me? Get, like, come on. Put this together real nice. I even add a theme song and intro the whole nine. You feel me? But yeah, this guy, this guy right here, he makes top of the line quality kitchens, man. His kitchens are out of this world. Oh my goodness. It's it's actually insane. So in this podcast, we talked about how intricate the, the kitchen industry is and how he creates and comes up with his ideas and where he plans on going with his ideas and some of the complications that he had. I thought it was very interesting to, to see someone, you know, the, like these kitchens are like in from 2055 and apparently it's been around for years. So please enjoy do your best to enjoy and if you don't enjoy it comment on why you didn't enjoy it love you all welcome back to another episode of important miscellaneous talks i am your host glassford crossfield and uh we're changing the world one podcast at a time please introduce yourself hi guys my name is josh delane uh, from a company called the woodworks and we make the best kitchens in the world or at least i think so oh i know you do <laughs> <laughs> Did you found or start the company or you just... So, no, so my parents started the company about 30 years ago um, when I was literally a baby and I had a completely different background. I studied as a, an accountant or a CPA in the US. Um, so did that for a couple of years and absolutely hated it. And about five or six years ago, I was looking at my opportunities and what I could do next. And my parents say, well, have you ever thought about, you know, joining the business? And I had never, ever considered it. I'm not very good with my hands. You know, I'm not, I'm not a practically minded person like my dad is, uh, who, you know, could make anything and, and, and design anything. But I had a business head on me. And I said, listen, if I'm going to join the business, we're going to try and push this to the next level. Um, and, they, and they were on board with it. So, yeah, so joined about five years ago and, uh, and we've been growing ever since. Would you say that a lot of your parents' concepts transferred over to you, or did you think you kind of took took your own route with the business? So in terms of the design side and the product side of what we make, yeah, absolutely. It's it's pretty much all my parents and 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 my dad um, predominantly. But before I joined, you know, the business was still a, a good sized business. I think we probably had about twenty members of staff. Uh, we had we didn't have a showroom or like a retail presence. It was all done from our workshop um, in the UK. And they grew very steadily and slowly through word of mouth. Um, they never advertised. They never did anything like that. So that's why I saw a massive opportunity and there was a lot of low hanging fruit. But in terms of their, their business culture, I think I've taken it and run with it. Um, and, and everything on the business and marketing side, it all stems down from what my parents put in place originally and, and how we do business and, and how we treat clients it's all, it all comes down from them and how they've run the business for 30 years. We're just running with it, basically. You know how, how they came up with these concepts for the kitchen? Because it seems like they've been living in like 2055 for like 20 <laughs> years ago. So, I mean, my, my dad is sort of a design director, if you want to think about it like that. So a lot of the concepts and, the, and the, especially the displays in our showroom he comes up with, he sits down, he's a very, very creative person. Uh, in terms of the specifics of things that go in the kitchen, I mean, he goes to trade shows, he, he, he puts himself out there and sees all the new trends that are coming in and all the things that we could potentially use. And the benefit is because we make everything here in the UK, we're not a, you know, a high street studio that orders their products from a factory in Germany, we make it ourselves. So we can be a bit more flexible in that regard, see something that we like at a trade show and within a couple of weeks have it in a kitchen. Mm. So I, I, I don't know what, what specifics you're referring to, but, you know, things like the pop-up sockets that are super smooth, uh, you know, boiling water taps, um, uh, you know, electric opening cupboards, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's all, you know, we have an idea, we discuss it. Um, my dad usually sits down with our operations director, Joel, who's consequently my, my best mate and I've known him my whole life and they, they flesh it out and, and they, and they make it work basically. And, and yeah, it's really, it's really stemmed from there. Got you. Got you. 
So w when you come up with an, a new concept or idea, what's the first step you take to implementing that into reality? So what will happen is uh, a prospective client will come through um, either on the phone or, or through the internet. And I will associate that to one of our design teams. So we've got seven senior designers now and a couple of junior designers. And really, I want to understand that client's requirements in terms of what sort of style they're looking for, because each one of our designers has a specific design um, trend that they you know, focus on. So if someone wants a super modern kitchen, it will go to uh, Tom, one of our designers, or if they want something really traditional, they'll speak to David, for example. From there, they'll come into the showroom or one of the showrooms and they will look at all of the displays that we've got there and the designer will sort of walk them through all of the different options. But really, to get to the heart of your question, it's driven by the client's requirements. So they might come to us and say, listen, we're a family of four, we've got two young kids. Um, we cook a lot. We entertain a lot. We need a lot of fridge space. We need a lot of freezer space because we cook, you know, batch cook and freeze it. And really from there, the designers will take that brief and they'll go away and they'll they'll design the kitchen specifically for that client's requirements. So everything is bespoke. Everything is one off that we do. Um, and really, it's just interpreting the client's requirements and what they need for their lifestyle. And then we translate that into a beautiful design that then gets that then gets made. Got you. Wow. So if someone if, if someone out there is trying to become the next Woodworks, what are some of the things you would recommend them do? Very good question. Um, <laughs> I never thought I'd be asked that question because when we started, when I started on this journey, I said, you know, I wanted to turn this company into a household name. And a couple of weeks ago, I was on a holiday, well, no, a couple of months ago, I was on a holiday with my family and speaking to my dad. And I said to him, how, how, we were having a conversation about how some of the bigger names in the industry, how they got there. And my opinion was that each of the names that we were discussing, they had owned a platform at one time or another. So mm. you've got the really old school names like Smallbone and Mark Wilkinson, and they really owned print media. Then you have people like Tom Howley, who are newer. They really owned the SEO side. People like Duvall and Humphrey Munson, they've sort of owned Instagram. And when I looked at it, there was like one place left for us to go, and it was TikTok. And people thought I was nuts um, because mm. people weren't showing really kitchen stuff on, on, on TikTok. And more importantly, it's, it's a young audience at the moment, or on the most part, it's a young audience. But if you look at what's happened with every single platform, it always starts young and then it skews older. So Facebook, when it started, was for college kids, right? And now my grandma's on Facebook. That I think the, the average age, you know, the, the most uh, active users on Facebook are, are, are 45 plus. So these platforms will age up. It's just a matter of time. So if we capitalize on the fact that no one else is doing it on TikTok now, really push that, really hammer it, put our content every single day. By the time that it ages up, we will be an authority on that platform. And I've hired a full-time videographer just to do TikTok. So, you know, I'm, I'm invested in it. So in terms of how could someone become the next Woodworks, it's a combination of things. It's product and making sure that you're design led and everything that you do is, is thought through carefully. It is most, most importantly, it's a service game because we're dealing with kitchens at, you know, $50,000 plus, and you, you have discerning clients, but you have people that are parting with a lot of money and you need to make sure they're looked after. You need to always do the right thing. Yes, you will have to, um, we call it swallow on jobs and you have to basically uh, take a hit financially in some instances to do the right thing, but you do that on the basis that there will be more business from it in the future. And that's always the way we've operated the business. So yeah, design, service, and really, today's day and age it's all about marketing and that's really where i focus my time now in the business it's about creating the brand image and uh you know the st strategy of, of of the brand and where we're going i really like how you think man wow so <laughs> i appreciate that where do you get that business savvy from uh i do you know what i actually was thinking about this the other day because i don't have a lot of friends like me who think like me um i'm very ambitious when I was when I was studying as an accountant and CPA, I, you know, I didn't love it. I went to work every day, nine to five. I was just trying to get that qualification. And then I knew I always knew I was going to move on. But I was always a big reader. And just after I left the CPA job, I started to dive into business books. And I don't know why. And it started with biographies of, of 
famous entrepreneurs. So people like Elon Musk's autobiography, um, Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos, the Everything Store, Jack Ma, the house that, uh, sorry, Alibaba, the, Jack, the house that Jack Ma built, all these books. And I was just absolutely blown away by the stories and these people that basically started something from nothing. And I really started to get into it. And I'm very much self-improvement kind of guy. I'm always on a self-improvement kick. I always want to be doing better uh, and it extends to all aspects of my life. But the business side, it's like, I want to know more and as much as possible. So I'm always listening to podcasts, reading books, talking to other you know, smart entrepreneurs and other clever people about what I could be doing that's better, different ways of looking at things. And really it's about being as unstubborn as possible and as open to different ideas and different ways of doing things as possible to, uh, to really capitalize on it. Um, so, you know, like I get up every morning and I do breathing exercises. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard of Wim Hof. He does Wim Hof. You do Wim Hof? Yeah. My oh, man. Oh. Yeah, of course. I recommend, I recommend Wim Hof to all my friends. It's life changing. Yes. It's you the cold shower too? A hundred percent every morning. Every oh morning. my goodness. Yeah. Yo, so Pete, again, like that, people think I'm absolutely nuts, but they've never tried it. They don't know. So Amazing. every, um, yeah, my, my routine every morning, I'll get the baby up and I'll, and I'll hand, hand him over to my wife. I'll go downstairs, do my breathing exercises. I'll do 45 minutes or something on the Peloton. And then I'll have my cold, freezing cold shower for two, two minutes, two and a half minutes. And people Did think I'm nuts. How early do you wake up normally? So I had a, I have a, a new baby. So he's 14 months old since the baby. It's been a bit later. So seven. But before the baby, every day it was 5 a.m., every day. Mm -hmm. And it was nice in that phase where we were really growing the business to get up at five, to start jumping on emails. And it, I was emailing and there was no one else up. And it was so nice. I got so much done. Mm -hmm. It's not as feasible with, with a young baby. And I've also been taking a lot of uh, notice of my sleep. And I've been doing a lot of research into sleep. And how important it is. I read a book called uh, Why We Sleep by a guy called Matthew Walker, who's a sleep scientist. And I, and I started to really take my sleep seriously. And so I have been trying to sleep more. I bought this, which is an aura, an aura ring. I don't know if you've heard of it. O-U-R-A. It's like a sleep tracker. That's a ring. Mm. So I, I, I look at that every morning, make sure that I'm sleeping enough because you read this book and it will scare you about how important sleep is. So yeah, I try, I try and go to 7 a.m. wake up, but when it's really busy, it'll be 5, 5.30. I, I try to tell like sleep, it, sleep is something that's not taken as seriously and like sleep can really a bad sleep can really shorten your life like, yeah, I don't yeah I mean if you read this book it's crazy that the studies that they've done and basically what they're saying which is completely true is sleep is the most democratic form of healthcare. so mm. you could rather than getting all these people into hospital for all sorts of ailments if everyone slept properly you would have a fraction of these issues interesting yeah interesting. yeah i tell people like yeah i need eight hours like i've noticed that for myself like eight hours ideally maybe seven seven and a half and then people look at me like i'm crazy <laughs> like, yeah i mean listen there's a, obviously a lot of criticism about hustle culture you know gary v people people slate him i like gary. um listen if if you love work and you love what you do i don't know why you should be slated That's for that fact, yeah. um but I don't think it should come at the cost of sleep, is my opinion. Um, there are times when you have to absolutely hammer it. I get that, and, and I've done that, and I've been there. Um, but I think as I'm getting older, I'm looking now at opportunities where every day I was getting up at five, but now I look at it and I'm like, look, I don't have that much on tomorrow. I'm sure things will come in, but I should take the opportunity here to have a, a few hours extra sleep. So I'm being a bit more flexible. So that's part of growth. So what would you say is, uh, what helps you get up on those days you really don't want to? Because no matter how motivated you are, man, 5 a.m. is still 5 a.m. And some days you don't want to do it. Some days you want to skip the Wim Hof. Some days you want to skip the Peloton. So yeah, what, yeah. what has you to, to keep doing it day after day? That's a really good question. I've never really thought about that. I, I, I am a very intrinsically motivated person. And... Mm. I have big goals, I have big ambitions. And so really that keeps me driving through. And yeah, of course there are those days where you, you don't wanna do the wake up and you don't wanna work till 11 o'clock at night, obviously. I think having a family now has sort mm. of shifted my perspective 
uh, because I'm not only doing it for myself, I'm doing it for my family as well. And family, not just my immediate family, my wife and my baby. I'm also, I've got my parents who started the company in the back of my mind and I don't want to let them down. And, you know, mm. they've been putting blood, sweat and tears into this for 30 years. Mm. And I don't think I could ever live with myself if it didn't go well. So I have, I have a lot of family motivation um, and that does, that does keep me going for sure, for sure. Okay, so I was going to ask you what keeps you motivated, but it sounds like your family, just your family and... You said you said a lot of it comes from internally. Where does that stem yeah. from? Um, I don't know. You know, I think I've got I've I've been very fortunate enough to grow up in a, you know, demographically it's a very wealthy and affluent um, part of the world, and I'm very grateful for that. And I suppose that's what I've grown up knowing. And I have you know friends that are very wealthy and and families that I know growing up very wealthy. So you see that and you think you know I'd love that for myself. Yeah. Um, and it gives you something to aim for. And, you know, I'd love to be, eh, I have this conversation with my wife all the time thinking, yeah, you know, if we if I got to the point where the business was on autopilot and I was, you know, I could retire early. And she always says to me, like, you'd, you'd never do that. You couldn't sit still for five minutes. You know, you'd always want to be doing something. I think I get that from my dad, my dad and my grandfather on my dad's side as well, exactly the same, could never stop. Always wanted to do something, always wanted to tinker. You know, I once went home, my dad, a couple of years ago, my dad, had a lull in, in work and he didn't have anything to do. And he, he literally unfold and refold a, a, his cabinet, his filing cabinet. I was like, what, what are you doing? But he has to be busy. He can't sit on his hands. And for me, I think I've, I, I don't take it that far. I, when I need to relax or want to relax, I do, I do take time to do that. And mm -hmm. in the evenings, once the baby's asleep, I do take time to unwind because you, you can't go a hundred miles an hour all day, every day, you will burn out. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to take that time um and also you know i i take the drive and the ambition with a pinch of salt which is that i want work-life balance i want to be able to spend time with my family mm. during lockdown i you know we had our baby pretty much during lockdown and i got to spend more time with my son than a lot of parents get to because of that mm. and that's been really special and so you know when i when i do have that opportunity i do like to spend time with my family and you know have some sort of balance that's interesting because a lot of people feel like people who come from a more fruitful background feel like they, they kind of have things made and, you know, that can, you know, breed a lot of lack of motivation for. for yeah, something. no, for sure. For sure. I think I, d I don't know, but I would assume that people at higher levels that I'm talking about extreme wealth, maybe that's the case. But there are a lot of exceptions to the rule. And I've got, a, I've got a very close friend, one of my best mates, and his family are astronomically wealthy. And he's an extremely motivated guy. And he, and he went to school and he got all A's and he went to university and he got a top class degree and he works his, his, works his nuts off. And he's, he's a, that's an amazing inspiration because he doesn't have to be doing it. You know, he could, he, you know, he could not do anything for the rest of his life and he'll be looked after, but he does. So, yeah, I suppose we're similar in that regard where, you want to want to strive for a bit more and i and i want to give my children please god the at least the level of upbringing that i've had into and opportunities that i've had so that that's you know a benchmark that's been set for me to at least aim for of course i'd like to take it a bit further but it's not just it's not all about money and it's not all about um you know conquering the world as i said you want to have some sort of balance and you know if i'm not met hundreds of millions but i i've spent an amazing time with my family and i can drop my kids at school and pick them up and whatever that's a really nice balance for me anyway has anyone noteworthy ordered from woodworks before? yes 100 percent. i can't talk <laughs> i can't talk too much about them because uh there's a few ndas in place but we have worked <laughs> with some very 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 high profile celebrities uh some of which are through interior designers some of which are for uh the celebrities directly and on the most part they've been really lovely clients um and we do a, a bit of stuff for influencers if you want to classify them as celebrities uh that is more public we've you know we put that on our socials and stuff um you know for a bit of extra brand exposure but yeah we we have done notable notable celebrities more <laughs> more uk based i don't know how you know some of the ones that we've done that are uk based you would definitely know in the us they're that big but yeah can't really talk too much about that unfortunately got you how long would you say the average woodwork kitchen takes to install? So the, the process from start to finish, from the first appointment with a client to finishing up, 
can take you know 20 weeks maybe but that is a lot of the design work in the beginning that can take eight weeks you've got making the kitchen depending on what sort of style it is and how complicated it can be anywhere from eight to 14 weeks 14 weeks at the most and then install two to three weeks from start to finish so it is a long process you are you are you're dealing with us for a long time and so and we have a lot of different members of staff that will interact with you as a client throughout that journey so you've got the designer for the first part then you've got your project manager who liaises with you th- talks to your builders and your electricians and your plumber and make sure that everything is going smoothly you see the installation team and how they're going off stone company and 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 you know the worktops once they're in so you know there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle and everyone has their bit that they have to deal with um but yeah it's quite it's quite a long process from start to finish you know you do get people saying oh you know i need a kitchen in four weeks and it's like what well, you know they're not sitting there ready to go you know we make it from scratch <laughs> to order depending on what you want but people don't you know people contact me at the beginning of december so i need it by christmas well i don't know where you're getting a kitchen in three weeks but it's not from us yeah i mean i i would understand because you have a pretty advanced sort of kitchen setup so i would assume that it would take a few months to kind of get that together <laughs> yeah listen it depends what 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 is involved the more traditional kitchen so you know with the ornate details and the, and the shaker panels and the moldings there's a lot more uh, hand labor involved in that. So really craftsmanship. There are people literally sitting there with a chisel, with, with saws, with, with uh, you know, um, hammers and drills, and they're doing that by hand. So those kitchens do take longer to process. We have a spray shop. So kitchens are painted, but they go into the spray shop. They're sprayed, you know, three coats, sanded in between. It's a long process. Uh, the modern stuff runs through a bit quicker. So that's why I say between eight and 14 weeks, the modern stuff does run through a bit quicker. Um, but, you know, there's also a backlog of jobs. If we started from scratch now and we had no jobs to process, you know, a modern kitchen we could do in, in a couple of weeks. But there's a schedule and there's, you know, lots of jobs going on at any one time. We're making three kitchens a week at any one time. So at least, so, you know, there's a lot. More importantly, how much does the average woodwork kitchen cost? Like if I was a buyer. So our average kitchen is probably around 50,000 pounds, which is what? $70,000, $75,000, maybe something like that. So that's the average, but we do kitchens at 30,000 pounds. So $40,000 and we do kitchens at a hundred thousand pounds or, you know, $130,000 roughly. I don't have my exchange rate knowledge at the moment. It's not great. <laughs> Um, so we do do a really wide variety and people say to us, you know, how can you do one kitchen at 30K and one kitchen at 100K? And I say, listen, the people that make it are the same. The processes in the factory are the same. It's made in the same workshop. The difference is the materials that you're choosing, the appliances that you're choosing and the worktops that you're choosing. Those are things that can really wildly change the price. But the product, in essence, is the same and the service is the same. So that's, that's for me, that's the most important. So if you don't have a hundred K, you know, there's not tons of those clients around. Um, so we can do, we can do both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. I don't know why people would be confused about the price because just like anywhere you go is a range of price based on quality. So hundred percent. Yeah. You could, you can, you can drive a, a mini or you could drive a Bentley. Yeah. Like, they both get used yeah. made to be, but they do it in very different styles. For real. Uh, and you know, some people, you know, you're always going to get those customers that want to buy something purely on price. And they'll say to us, you know, um, I got your, your quote and it's 50,000 pounds, but I went to somewhere down the road and it was 35,000. And I'm like, yeah, but it's two different things. The people from down the road are buying it standard products from Germany. They're putting it on a container and they're shipping it over. There's nothing bespoke about that with us. You're giving us your, your exact requirements. We're making your units exact, you know, six, nine, three millimeters rather than 600 because that's exactly what the wall needs. And it's tailored to meet your requirements. You wouldn't expect to go to Savile Row and get a suit made by a tailor for the same price that you're buying it off the rack at Zara. You know, it's, it, mm. and that, but, but people think, oh, it's a suit's a suit. And so they're comparing the same prices, but that's not the way that we look at it. And in fairness, we put a video up on our website and did a whole page on the website dedicated to pricing because we were getting people that didn't know, you know, you're saying you look at our stuff and you think, you know, it's expensive and that's great. But a lot of people don't. So we, we spent time dedicating a whole page on the website about pricing so that we could disqualify 
as horrible as that sounds, as many people as we qualify. So we could tell people, you know, you're not, you know, you're not our end of the market or you're not our customer. Unfortunately, if you're looking to spend 10 to 15,000 pounds, you know, there's lots of companies that can service you, but unfortunately that's not us. And I don't want to waste your time. And obviously by the same token, we don't want them to waste our time. So we made it very clear on the website. And since then we've had less people calling up with, with, should we say unrealistic budgets. Got you. What would you say is the biggest issue in the kitchen industry today? Right now, uh, it's appliance lead times. So, uh, you know, your appliances, your ovens, your hob, your fridges, uh, probably about two years ago, we could order them and have them within four weeks. Right. And now you'll be lucky to get them within 20 weeks, which means that we have to act a lot sooner with those clients and make them very aware that they're going to have to place the order sooner so that when they want their kitchen to be installed, that all the appliances are there. Um, and I think it's been brought about by a few things. First of all, coronavirus hasn't helped because a lot of production lines completely stopped. So they're still playing catch up. Um, there's a semiconductor shortage, a world semiconductor shortage, which there's one in every appliance and that hasn't helped. Um, and then you've obviously got the, the freight rates and uh, you know transport costs from China, from, from Europe gone up which means that they want to send fewer uh, sorry more things on a single container so they're waiting for stock to build up before they send it out so there's a number of things that's a real real challenge at the moment and then also we're getting price rises left right and center from our suppliers price of timbers going up through the roof price of sheet materials going through the roof stone everything's more expensive now mm. because of yeah. because of where we are in the world um i mean i got an email the other day from one of our sink suppliers and they said that they're refusing to take any order for sinks because the old wide supply of stainless steel is so uncertain. I mean, you, you couldn't make this up, um, you know, with what's going on in, in, in Ukraine. A lot of the shipping routes are through the Black Sea and, and they were getting stainless steel from that part of the world. And now it's just completely, they don't know, it's up in the air, so they can't take orders. So, you know, listen, you, you've got to be adaptable and you've got to be nimble and you've got to be agile. And really, as long as you're quick to react, you should be all right. But it's it's tough. You've got to take every day as it comes. Wow, that sucks, man. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I feel sorry for clients because, you know, they they we tell them the kitchen takes 12 weeks to make fine. But if the appliances don't, you know, they're taking 20 weeks, something that's completely out of our hands then they're going to be waiting a long time for their kitchen. And obviously that's not what we want. Um, but that is the way, the way of the world. Everyone have everyone is having the same problem in the kitchen industry. So, mm. you know, it's not like it's just our problem, mm. thankfully. Um, and I think that people are now understanding, you know, the general public, when they go to a department store and they try and buy a Hoover or a vacuum cleaner, and they realize that there's none in stock and it's, take, it's 10 weeks to get one. They're starting to understand that mm. this is this is a bigger problem affected at everything, not just the kitchen appliances. If you weren't in the premier kitchen industry, what would you be doing for a living? So I actually run a marketing agency on the side, um, and that is built off of the knowledge that I have, um, you know, learned and put together over the last five or six years running the marketing for for my family business. Um, and, you know, coming from an accountancy background, going into marketing, you think, well, I used to think there's no way, like, you know, marketers are creative and they're, you know, they're, they're completely different to what an accountant is. And very quickly, once I started playing with Facebook ads and all this stuff, I started realizing that marketing or digital marketing these days is just as much about maths as it is about art. And if I can get really creative people around me to do that side of it, and I focus on the strategy and the numbers and the data, we've got a good partnership here. So I built up my knowledge over six or seven years. Obviously, we're doing great things with the woodworks in terms of the marketing. And I used to get a lot of people, friends, and really asking me for advice on their marketing. And I would always give out free advice, of course. Um, still happy to give out free advice to an extent. But really, I thought to myself, I really have to be charging. Them. I reckon there's something here. So I started a marketing agency. I have a handful of clients that we're doing some great work for. Um, but... Yeah, so I'd say I'd say something in digital marketing, but only because it's led led me down this path through doing what I'm doing now. Um, so yeah, and it, and it goes hand in hand because what I learn on the marketing side from other clients, I can use in the woodworks and vice versa. 
what would you say is the biggest lesson that you've learned about business and the biggest lesson that you learned about marketing throughout all your experience? Okay, so marketing, it's it's quite, I'm, I'm quite concise on this because I've, I've given it a lot of thought. So marketing now, this time, March 2022, marketing is no longer about throwing up some Facebook ads and hoping for some arbitrage. Yes, you can, and there is a, a, a small opportunity, depending on what you're selling, for an arbitrage piece, which is I'm paying X to acquire a customer, I'm selling that service or product for Y, and I can, and I can take that bit in the middle. There is an opportunity for that, but ultimately, marketing now has to be omnichannel. So you have to be hitting customers from every angle, Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, uh, Pinterest, for us, hows, we're on YouTube, and then there's the, the organic side, YouTube, TikTok, all of the organic stuff on Instagram and Facebook. They're, it's so holistic now, and you have to look at it as, a, as an ecosystem rather than just, you know, I do some good work on Facebook or some good work on Instagram. You can't be at the mercy of one platform. You know, I, I've got, we've built up our Instagram account. Instagram account has 75,000 followers. TikTok's at 350,000 followers. They could go away tomorrow. We could be banned for whatever reason. I, I don't know. I'm not in control of that. But we'll still have the YouTube channel. We'll still have all of our SEO efforts that we do on the website. So you really have to be omni-channel and you have to be everywhere. Um, and then it's about finding really creative people to, to make appealing content that could go viral. And, and, and TikTok's a great example of that. You know, We started posting videos, started from scratch, probably not even a year ago. And we're up to 350,000 followers. And that's because we make cool content. And, you know, one video pops off. We've got one video that's done 20 million views. It's got 4 million likes. It's crazy. And all it takes is one. You know, you could be a complete unknown person, post one video on TikTok. All of a sudden, you've got 100,000 followers overnight. So that's on the marketing side. On the business side, um, that's a very good question. Um, I would say that first and foremost, it's about getting your getting your marketing fixed to a point where you have a reliable inflow of leads or sales coming in. And once you've got that as a business owner, you can then focus on the other side of it, which is building the team. So when I started, my dad and my mum together saw every single client, okay? Because it was just word of mouth. It came in, they knew my mum and dad, they called them, can you come for a meeting? They never had a, a design team. They never had a sales team. And since I've come in, we've now got this, this sales team of seven people and they are the ones that see clients and they do the designs. And my dad doesn't know half the jobs that, that go out the door from the workshop because it's so far removed from him. But these people are experts at what they do. And rather than trying to be a jack of all trades, you probably got to analyze the business. What takes most of your time? Do an audit. What takes most of your time? And what of that could I outsource to another person to another hire that could then take my mind out of the day-to-day -day so much that i can focus on bigger picture and the minute you can do that you can start to grow the business and work on the business rather than work in the business and the other thing i've just remembered i read a book called traction by a guy called gino whitman and it was one of the best business books i've ever read and they talk about implementing a system uh, they call it an EOS or an entrepreneurial operating system. And it's basically a way of setting up your business and everyone in the senior management team's mindset and how to set goals and work back from those goals to get to your weekly targets. And it basically is just a way of mapping out your business, but it's a really interesting book and it's definitely changed the way that we, we run our business for sure. Um, it's got tips about uh, how to analyze whether you've got the right people on board, whether they're in the right positions. Um, you know, it's, it's a phenomenal book. So that's, that's, that's a little tip definitely for people to read. Got you. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. That is all the questions I have for you. Really appreciate your time. Lovely to meet you. You man. Uh, all this stuff will be in the description, man. He's a lovely fellow. <laughs>